How's it everyone? And it is great to have you joining us for this video sermon resource. If you don't know who I am or you're new to Emmanuel, my name is Tom and I am the youth pastor here. Now these video resources are not a replacement for church. In actual fact, they're there to encourage us along the way during the week. So if you're watching at home and you aren't linked to a church, can we please encourage you to reach out to your local youth pastors or pastors or church and get involved. Finally, if you'd like to know more about Emmanuel, why don't you check out our website below. Good morning. Today's reading will be taken from Ephesians 5 verses 15 to 21. Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Here ends the reading. All right. Thanks, Janine. Doesn't our Bible reader look amazing today, hey? <laughs> well, Happy New Year! Happy New Year! What a great, uh, what a great, uh, just opportunity. First thing uh, in the new year. Uh, I know it was a challenge for some of us. I know uh, I've already received a few messages this morning, uh, with some letting me know they're joining us, uh, you know, online uh, and so forth and that. Uh, but what an opportunity to come together uh, to uh, celebrate uh, and to hear from the Lord uh, as we hear from His Word, you know, the first thing uh, that we do as His people um, in this new year. So really glad to be able to spend it with each and every one of you here today. And to echo Jock's words right at the beginning, really glad to uh, see a few new faces here, a few friendly faces visiting us this morning. Uh, like Jock said, uh, we want you to feel welcome and we're really glad uh, to have you guys uh, with us here. Now, um, a little bit of exciting news I shared uh, in, a, in a note that I wrote and sent out uh, to those of you uh, members of the church and you know, those who are a little bit more part of the furniture here at Emmanuel. By the way, if, you, if, if maybe you felt that I've left you out, what I mean is that to anybody that is part of our WhatsApp group, that uh, admin-only info group, as well as our, our uh, mailing list, if, you, if you're not and you want to be a part of that, just you know, sign your name, give your details at the info hub, the desk uh, at the in the foyer there, and you will be. Um, but a bit of news that I shared was the excitement that myself and the elders and, and the rest of the ministry team are, are looking forward to with our new youth pastor uh, who's joining us uh, here. Uh, just in a few days' time, in fact, uh, Tom and Helena Potter, they're actually, um, in, a, in a day or so, they're actually going to start making their way up to PE from Hermanus. Um, Tom has been here already. We've uh, seen him preach in our evening service. Uh, he's taken a youth uh, meeting uh, already. Uh, he's met our teens. Uh, we've seen him on stage behind the drums. He's a gifted musician in many different ways. Uh, in fact, he has his own recording studio. Uh, and we're excited to have Tom join our team here uh, officially as a curate, a trainee minister, while he'll be responsible uh, for the youth. Uh, not that I'm stepping away from the youth, but I'm there to back him up. Um, and really just to, you know, really introduce the, him to the teens, the teens to him. Uh, and then we are excited just to see how just the potters, you know, grow here as part of our church. Um, so I want to, I'm, I'm mentioning that this morning because it's an exciting development, definitely. Um, but I want to ask you to be a part of welcoming them, encouraging them, praying for them uh, as they settle into life here. They're not from PE, uh, good old uh, GQ. Uh, they're from the Western Cape. Uh, and so they're not only settling into a new church, into a new uh, job as such, uh, but into a new town. Uh, and that can be daunting, as many of you, no doubt, uh, will know. So, you know, already get hold of them, uh, invite them over for supper, ask how you might be able to get to know them. I know they love mountain biking, they love the outdoors, uh, love music as well. Um, but let's be a part of this together as a church as we draw them in uh, and welcome them in because of how our Savior has welcomed us in uh, together. Now, uh, I'm not a massive one for social media, 
But my role as a pastor, a role which calls me, any, any pastor, in fact, uh, to shepherd the flock, to pastor the flock, calls us to know, uh, the, to know the church, you know, to know the people that the Lord has called us to lead and, and, and guide. Uh, and nowadays, in many ways, while, when many folk won't necessarily tell you how they're doing, it's amazing how they will post it right out there, you know, uh, in social media. There's a, another minister in our midst this morning, and I think he's most likely agreeing with me. Um, but it's amazing how, how so often, um, and I know I'm blanketing and I'm generalizing here, um, but, but you find out how somebody's doing because they've broadcasted it to the world out there. Now, so what this means is it takes me to social media and a clear difference that I've seen this year compared to years gone by, you know, as we approach the new year, um, as we approach, you know, the New Year celebrations, and, you know, as norm normally the memes kind of roll out, memes which say, you know, uh, I'm going to own the next year. I think those of you who've spent a bit of time will agree with me, we've seen far less of those than what we have in years gone by. Far less. Um, I think for many of us, 2022 hit hard, you know, in many different ways. And so it might just leave you wondering, you know, what lies in store a little bit hesitant. What lies in store for me in 2023? Thinking, you know, how do, how do I even approach, how do I think about entering this new year, let alone considering New Year's resolutions, you know? Now, thankfully, the Bible, uh, while it doesn't specifically reference any New Year's habits, uh, it does have a lot to say about how we think about life in general. Uh, and also how our understanding of God and our relationship with Him, our, our salvation, has a bearing on our lives. And so while we're here this morning, okay, for those of uh, us here in the room and those joining online and no doubt those who will uh, listen to this message, uh, you know, later on during the week, uh, what I want to do is I, I want us to, to have a look, to hear from the Lord, not to, you know, hear from this uh, average dude up front here, but to be taught by His Word about our thinking, about how we think about our lives as we, as we move into this new year. So why don't we pray uh, as we do that together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this new day, and we thank you for this new year. And Father, uh, while you have uh, given us the breath in our lungs, while we have opened our eyes this morning, just mindful of some of those new morning mercies, knowing that you have blessed us in so many ways that we just take for granted or don't even realize. Father, I thank you too for the fact that we know that we have a Savior this day and every day going forward, that we have relationship with you through that Savior who is Jesus Christ. And so, Father, our prayer is that that salvation, that life that you have given us, Lord, that we look at this new year, that we look uh, towards the coming days and weeks and months, Father, through the lens of that relationship that you have given us in and through Jesus. Shape us, encourage us, Father, and use us. Uh, and do that now as you form us through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm um, uh, here in Ephesians, if you've spent any time in the book, you, you might know Ephesians chapter 6 is the great, you know, the great battle, of, ba battle passage uh, where the Apostle Paul, who writes his letter to the Ephesian church, where he writes saying, put on the full armor of God. Uh, and, you know, and he explains the various parts very famously. The, many of those you know, are the kind of bumper sticker verses, uh, the ones that we highlight as believers, rightly so. Uh, and while what, what can happen is we might think uh, that this uh, is the only part in this letter where Paul uses the, the, the war metaphor, you know, where he refers to, to uh, the Christian life being a battle or, or you know, be, being prepared for war as such. But if you read through the letter, start to finish, you'll see that that is actually a major theme of the whole letter. Okay, right from the beginning, uh, right to the end. And in fact, chapter 5, well, in many regards, you know, we might know it as, as you know, the marriage uh, chapter, chapter 5 is actually full of that as well, right through it. Um, and what Paul does is he, he's, he, he tells us, uh, he tells the Ephesians, he tells us that the world we live in is not a friendly one for growing spiritually. Uh, it says it, chapter 5, verse 8, says the world is dark. Uh, verse 14, he says the world is a grave. Uh, and today, the section that Janine read, he writes and says the age, the world we live in, the age is evil. 
Now, in case you're sitting here thinking, wow, what a downer, you know? Paul's message is one that is honest and realistic. And what you will see is it is one that encourages us. But, but it encourages us to walk uh, and to fight in that world. If you go back to verse 8, he says, walk as children of the light. So he's honest about the challenges. But he's also real with us about how we will face them, how we will get through them as children of the light, knowing that Jesus Christ is that true light of the world. Now, one of my favorite movies, uh, a classic, in, in fact, today, Saving Private Ryan. I'm sure uh, most of us, uh, you know, have, have seen it. Uh, the movie starts with that dark day uh, as, um, as uh, the, 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 the troops uh, approach the Normandy beach. 5,000 ships carrying 175 Allied troops. Sorry, 175,000 Allied troops. On the, on the 6th of June, 1944, World War II. Uh, and, the, and what the scene in this movie, what it does, is it, it paints very well what I can only imagine to be just the weightiness of what those soldiers must have been, been facing in their minds as they were on those troop carriers moving towards uh, that beach. Uh, that fateful dread that they knew they were going to get off those boats to face. You know that over 12,000 of those soldiers lost their lives in just the first 15 minutes of that battle. They literally, uh, as they climbed off those troop carriers onto the beach, they first had to clamber over uh, numbers of dead bodies to be able to get uh, to that beach. Um, and what you'll see in that opening scene is there's this constant stream of radio messages to those soldiers just before they land on the beach, over and over again, saying something along the lines of, the battle is serious, but you've been prepared for this, boys. You've been prepared. And that they had. Okay, that they had. Friends, the, the crux of what Paul is saying, just as we uh, develop a little bit of understanding of where, we, where we're coming into in this letter, the crux of what he's saying is he's writing to the Ephesians and he's writing to every Christian, to every believer, and he's saying the battle is real. The battle's real. Life is not a holiday. Uh, and don't get fooled by that notion. So here's how we go and live it. You know, here's how we go and live it. Maybe in today's context, here's how we face the rest of this new year, that is 2023. Uh, and he said this all through the lens of our salvation. You know, Ephesians 1, that we were dead in our transgressions, lost in our sins, in other words, just kind of existing as spiritual zombies. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. We are saved by grace through faith. And so he writes with that understanding, that basis set, that we are saved, that we are prepared for the battle that is this life. And it means, it means a different life to the world that we live in today. You see, the thing is, often as believers, as Christians, we might be, uh, come to understand something which develops to be quite a, quite a significant lie in our lives, that because we know God, that we can expect the easy life, or the comfortable life, or the good life. That is not the case. Now, I think after 2022, we need that reminder. You know, many of us, especially those most influenced by first world consumerism and, uh, and entitlements, um, we've slowly slipped into that thinking, you know, that life should be comfortable, that it should be easy, you know, in many respects that we deserve it. And so we're often seriously dismayed when we experience the difficulties of the world. Uh, so here, you know, at the beginning of the new year, Paul, chapter 5, tells us how to navigate this battle that is life, uh, and he gives us five practical points. Now, you know me, I'm not a fan of five, you know, easy ways, you know, to, to make it through, but Paul here, it's quite clear, five practical points, gospel-centered points to work through in terms of thinking about life in 2023. And so, first of all, verse 15, as we read, Paul says, look carefully how you walk. Look carefully how how you walk. Verse 15, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. And then again, verse 17, so don't be foolish, he says, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, there's a serious tone to this. You, know, you can kind of feel the, you know, the, 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 the seriousness. I imagine him you know, pointing a finger. Consider your walk. Pay careful attention attention, not being foolish, but work 
You know, work at it. Understanding God's will for your life. So in other words, Paul's saying, you know, he's saying, check yourself. Check yourself. Stop just going through the motions, but take a moment, pause, and see how, how what he's saying in the context of the section we're in. He's saying that's where it starts. At the beginning of, you know, first day of Jan 2023, knowing that we've uh, already had a few public holidays, we, we already have, you know, tomorrow another public holiday and so forth, uh, I'm sure most of you still have some time, most, you know, before you head back to work. I know there's a number of folk here in retail and are still uh, burning the candle in, in, in many regards. But what I want to encourage you is that before, you know, thinking about physical or professional goals, just hit pause. Just hit pause. Take stock of your walk. A few years ago, uh, during what many of us uh, PE folk go through, which I like to call the Ironman stage, okay, I was, I was into triathlon and Ironman was, was, was my game. Uh, and me being the technical kind of guy that I, that I am, you know, I love specs and I like kind of, uh, I like just thinking about efficiency, you know, in many different ways. Uh, what I do from time to time is uh, I take a video of me on my time trial bike, uh, my bike used for, for Ironman, on a stationary trainer while I was cycling uh, and, uh, you know, performing the pedal strokes. And then I'd send that video off to a friend of mine who's a, a coach and a biokineticist. Um, and what he'd do is he'd slow down the video, he's a cycling specialist, and he'd analyze my movement. He'd analyze my pedal stroke and look how my body was moving on the bike and you know, think about aerodynamics with all the, the cleverness that he had studied and, uh, and so forth. And do you know that every single time, not just the first time, but every single time over a number of years uh, that I'd do that and send that on to Ryan, this friend of mine, I'd get a whole bunch of feedback and suggestions on changes to make to optimize my, my cycling. You know, the bicycle leg of the Ironman. Every time. Now, maybe you, you're not into triathlon, you know, but many of us, what do we do? We go to financial planners who, who take a look, who analyze things. Um, in terms of our health, what do we do? We go to a doctor uh, and we let a specialist review our health and advise us. Friends, this is not something that's strange to us. And so similarly, Paul says, analyze your walk. Pay careful attention. Now, as he talks about, uh, about our walk, what he's actually referring to is our lives in relation to God uh, and to sin. See, that's, that's the walk that he's talking about. Uh, and he says it, verse 16, he says, the days are evil. So he's making that point saying, you who is living in a time where the evil one is ready to pounce, how are you doing with sin? How are you doing with sin? John Owen famous Puritan famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Okay. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Either we're aware of the realities of sin in our lives and we seek God's grace in repenting and overcoming it, or it becomes normal as such. Uh, and we, you know, we, we excuse it. Uh, and it builds and it builds a, a hold that it has over you. Uh, and folks, there is no one person, none of us, are immune to that reality. It's either one or the other. So slow down. Slow down. Stop looking around at others and analyze your own intentions. Take stock of your heart. You know, seek God's wisdom. He's given us tremendous wisdom uh, in his word. But don't just stop there. Ask that Christian friend, you know, that friend that you can trust to be uh, brutally and lovingly honest uh, and work out where and how and in what ways sin might have its hold on your life, on your walk, and bring that to the Lord. Take stock. So that's the first uh, and main foundational starting point. Uh, but secondly, secondly, Paul says, be intentional with your time. Verse 16, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Make the most of it. Make the most of it. Now let's, you know, let's be honest here for, uh, for a moment. If I'm honest with myself, I don't naturally feel like seeking God. Okay, wow, you know, pastor saying that. 
get up in the morning, the last thing, the last thing I feel like doing is reading my Bible. No, no, I'm, I'm sure that's many, many of you. You know, we think about the thousand other things to do, to get to the office, you know, to return those emails that are just waiting there uh, in the morning. You know, we can easily think, well, you know, I should just sleep an extra 30 minutes because I need more energy today. Or if it's been a long day at night, you know, um, I know I need to sleep and I should go to bed earlier, but I, I just feel like watching TV. I've had a hard day. But friends, if you're going to grow with God, you have to set priorities. You have to set priorities. Now, a common point made in the Bible, and one that's even been picked up in the most modern self-help, you know, secular self-help uh, books nowadays, is that if you don't plan your time, something or someone else will. Okay. You don't have to be uh, around long to, to see that. Uh, in this case, Paul's saying if you don't take control of your time, being intentional, seeing God through it, the world will take control. And friends, the outworking of that will be a life directed away from God. And remember what, what Paul says to the Ephesians about the world. Okay. Now, in most instances, I'm not talking about, you know, those, those obvious bad things. You know, much of that busyness will be, can be, and, and, and is important stuff. But be aware of the tyranny of the urgent. Be aware of the tyranny of the urgent. You know, for most of us, it's not the case that we don't grow with God because we intentionally make a decision to go and worship Satan, okay? <laughs> That's not the case, okay? It might, you know, it might sound shocking, but it's often that there is so much tedious stuff to do, you know, so much clutter uh, in the busyness that we neglect the most important things, and we can lose track of our relationship with the Lord completely. So how do we start with that intentionality? Well, later on, okay? Paul, Ephesians 6, verse 18, he says, Pray at all times in the Spirit, with every prayer and request. Okay, be wise with your time. But I also want to encourage you. Because often we think, you know, in a world where we're all about doing stuff, the most active thing that we can do is seek the Lord first on our knees and ask Him, ask Him to guide us and help us and fight that laziness, fight those urges. Do it not in our own strength, but in His. So then, uh, carry on, and third of all, Paul says, walk in the Spirit. Okay. But he says this with a clear contrast. Have a look at verse 18. He says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. Hey, there we go. So I suppose, actually, you know, actually what Paul's saying is he's, he's saying, be filled with the Spirit and don't fill yourself with spirits, okay? Be filled with the Spirit, don't fill yourself with spirits. Now, now two things here. I'm aware that we're working through this passage with reference to not being drunk on much wine on the morning after the greatest spirit-filled festival of the year. Okay? You guys know what I mean? Okay. I didn't actually choose this passage specifically because of that. But you see, many will say, you know, it's the holidays. We deserve it. You know, some will even say, you know, but the Bible says we're free, right? Free to do whatever we want the first part. But then secondly, some will also say or ask, you know, okay, does this, mean, does this mean the Bible teaches a clear prohibition of alcohol? Now the thing is, uh, the point that Paul's making here to cover both of these issues is that while he's addressing a very clear problem in Ephesus, which was drunkenness, okay, he's teaching us a much greater principle here. Much greater. See, by the way, Paul draws this contrast between being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, and drunkenness. He teaches us on, about, about those clear differences. See, alcohol, what does alcohol do? It numbs the senses. Uh, it lessens one's ability to wisely discern a situation. You know, very clear reason why, uh, you know, the, the law states you don't climb behind a wheel or operate heavy machinery or, you know, whatever it might be. The Holy Spirit, though? Holy Spirit, He does the complete opposite. 
He makes you more aware of reality by his guidance and conviction. See, in a time where many turn to alcohol to cope, the Holy Spirit gives you a way to cope by opening your eyes to the reality of God. Now think of this. Alcohol. Alcohol gets, gets rid of the worry. How? By making you forget, right? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit gets rid of worry by helping you remember helping you remember that you are not alone, that there is one who is uh, there with you in it. Uh, Alcohol gives you courage by making you unaware of the dangers around you. The Spirit gives you courage by showing you how much larger God is than your fears. Alcohol adds excitement to your life, you know, by giving you a kind of a cheap thrill. The Spirit adds, adds excitement to your life by reminding you of the overflowing promises of God and His goodness to you. Friends, the, the, the two are polar opposites. Polar opposites. Now, this isn't just a prohibition on alcohol. Okay, not talking legalistically, not, not that you know, we, we, we know the Bible teaches us in many ways. And I say this with tremendous caution. Okay. Paul himself uh, wrote to Timothy and said, you know, have a little wine, you know, to treat the, 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 the ailments of your stomach. Okay, it's not that the Bible is anti-alcohol, but the principle that it is teaching here is that this applies to anything that we turn to to avoid or to numb or to alter reality. So it might be alcohol, you know, it might be drunkenness, Uh, but it might be other narcotics, but it doesn't stop there. Now, I want to press in on alcohol here. Uh, And the reason I want to press in on alcohol here, knowing that there is a whole bunch of other means that the world today, you know, uses to turn to, and uh, knowing that we in the room here have our own experiences. The reason why I want to press in on alcohol uh, is that because in our world, it's it's kind of become this acceptable addiction, right? Uh, I'm sure you know the term, you know, functional alcoholic. Functional alcoholic. Well, that's just just affirming that that, that, that it's okay. And friends, my concern and the concern that Paul is highlighting here is that when we see that in the church as well, Because the greater tragedy, the greater tragedy tragedy is that you're turning to something else and not relying on the one who is there with you. That is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God himself, who is there with you. And so we must be aware of that. We must be aware of that. We must be aware of our dependence on alcohol, and many other, many other vices. So that's the third part. Fourthly, Paul says we don't turn to worldly inhibitors, okay, thirdly, to fill us up. Why? Because we are filled by God himself, and the reality of that, fourthly, is that this filling flows out in praise. Okay, we've done that this morning. Uh, He says, sing a new song in your heart. Now, over and over, Paul encourages us uh, through this passage to grow in God's wisdom, to seek God's will. But, but you see, the, the kind of growth he's talking about here is not just the kind of thing that happens uh, in a lecture room if you go off to seminary or to Bible college, or, or, or you, know, you, you sign up for that new Bible course. All good things, right? But he's talking about true knowledge of your personal Savior and the freedom that he has won for you from the hold of the world And the reality of that uh, and of his spirit living within you is it flows out in praise. It flows out in in praise. Uh, And it's amazing how that happens naturally by singing. Some of of you might feel, well, you know, I'm not that musical and that, but it's amazing. You know, you see a beat going, and man, we see the feet tapping. Okay, we heard it uh, last night, you know, late after midnight from our home. We stay not too far from Distasi. Uh, if anybody knows that, that uh, reality in, in, in Lorraine. Um, music is something that the Lord has created us naturally 
to enjoy uh, and, to, and to hear in that. But the reality of when he is living and working within us is that praise comes out through that. Uh, it comes out through song. Uh, and it's amazing how it naturally happens uh, through singing. Now think about it for a second. Think about, you know, if you've been around church or if you've been a believer or maybe even just grown up in church many years ago and maybe you're back for the first time, think about how much you know about God, okay, that you've actually learned through singing, that you've actually learned through songs. You know, maybe more modern contemporary songs that we sing now. Think about Amazing Grace, okay? My chains are gone. I've been set free. Now the song we sing, Cornerstone, that reality that Peter highlights, Christ, our central cornerstone, in Christ alone. You know, those are songs we sing today. But think about many of the old hymns that don't just, uh, just kind of land on one central truth, but hymns which are packed with solid theology. But think about the simple songs. You know, Father Abraham has many sons. Many sons as Father Abraham, I and one of them, and so are you. You're singing about the covenant. Friends, the Lord's he's placed an appreciation for song and a mechanism deep within us that's related to being image bearers of the living God. And he says, sing it in your heart. Praise to the Lord. By the way, do you know, I, especially over the last year, I've sat with a number of people who are passing, you know, moments before they close their eyes for the last time. And it's amazing how settling just singing a simple Christ-exalting song is to the heart through that. The Lord knows what he's talking about. So praise him. Sing to him. Now, just as we finish off, I want to remind you when... Paul says, sing a song. We have seen our Savior do just that. Matthew 27, right towards the end of the chapter, where Matthew writes about Jesus being nailed to that cross. Okay, one of the very last things Jesus, our Savior, said was, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, anybody who was Jewish, which was everybody back then, would have recognized that Jesus himself was singing a song. Psalm 22 starts off. Okay, the Hebrew prayer and songbook, Psalm 22, starts off saying just that, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? See, what was happening there was Jesus was being nailed to that Roman cross singing a song of abandonment from his own father, God himself. Because the reality in that moment, he was carrying, he was bearing all the sins of the world on him. And the beauty of the gospel and relationship with Jesus Christ is he sung that song of abandonment, friends, so that we never have to so that we never have to, so that we can sing amazing grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free because of that one who pardoned me. The moment he was on the cross to pay for our sin, Jesus sung that song of abandonment. Also that he could draw us into him that he could draw you nearer to him, that he could draw you into relationship with him as your personal savior, make you part of the family. So that brings us to our fifth and last point of advice this morning. See, Paul writes all of this, and he writes saying that we're encouraged to do all of this, okay, but also to be around the people of God because of our relationship with God. Have a look at verse 19, and don't miss the context as to what he's saying there. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. See what he's saying there? Okay. You can only do that in relationship with 
one another. 58 times in the New Testament we see these one another passages. And the point Paul's making there, friends, is you can only do this if you're around. Uh, You can only do this if you're involved. You can only truly know more of the depth of God's love if you know one another. If you know each other. Let's be practical for a moment. I mean, we're talking about five practical points. Why don't we take a moment and look around the room? Don't look at me. You know, look at the person next to you. Look back. Uh, I know not too many of us are, are here this morning. Okay? But think about those who you know within this church, within this church family. Paul says, the reality of our relationship with God is that we praise Him by praising together with one another. Now, I know there's a number of you who appreciate our online services. And, and it's our conviction that we're going to carry on doing these because there's a, a number in our church family, in our community, who are bedridden, who are housebound. Uh, and so on days when they can't get here, it's been a tremendous blessing you know, for them to still feel part. We see this as a part of being a, a, a continued connection to the church. But friends, uh, and for those of you who you know, have enjoyed this, I want to remind you that these are never seen as a replacement of church. Never as a replacement of church. See, church is an integral part of your relationship with God. And it is never and has never been a spectator sport. Jesus Christ went to that cross to draw you in. To make you part of the family. And his plan until he comes again is that he grows us in the context of his covenant community. So this year, this year, if you truly want to grow, okay, what does it mean? It means get involved. You know, join that life group. Take that, uh, that someone you know, that you might have seen uh, over a few weeks. Uh, introduce yourself to them. Take them out for coffee. Get to know them. Uh, sign up for the Explore course. Excellent. Excellent. Get involved in church. Serve the body. Get to know the intricacies of this community that the Lord has brought you to and grow through that. So there it is. You know, life, 2023, the honest truth is we don't know whether it's going to be an easy year or a hard year. But life is a battle if we're brutally honest. But the Lord gives us the means to engage in it. He is there with us in it. And if you might have been honest with yourself this morning, if you were maybe just taking stock of yourself this morning, and maybe you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by your own sin, I want to remind you of that song of abandonment that Jesus sang so that you don't have to. Hand it over to the Lord. Know that you are forgiven. And in fact, this is how Psalm 22 finishes. It says, the humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Know that you can go into this year, whatever comes your way, because you have an eternal relationship with the living God. That is what matters. So let's come before him now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that even though we might know what, not, not know what lies in store for us over the next coming weeks and months, let alone you know, as we climb in our cars and head down the road today, Father, I thank you. I truly thank you that we can know you, the living God, had drawn us in by the abandonment that you experienced on our behalf. So Father, we want to thank you and praise you for that. Uh, and Lord, we, uh, our prayer this morning is that through the lens and through the reality of your Spirit within us, not at a distance, not only on Sundays as we uh, come to church, Father, but through the reality of your Holy Spirit living within us, Father, will you equip us, cause us to take stock, Cause us to, to hand over and repent from those parts of our lives that, that we want control of. 
that we fight for control, the, uh, the, the sinfulness in that, Lord, and remind us that you have taken that on yourself. You have paid for that, and we are forgiven. And Father, too, just within the context of what we've looked at this morning, I pray for those, those many of us who have turned to artificial means to avoid life, to numb the realities maybe of the difficulty of the last year. And Father, our prayer to you is that you not only show us the insufficiency of those things, Lord, but by your grace, you show us the sufficiency of your spirit, of salvation in Jesus Christ, and the fact, Lord, that you are the one, the only one, that frees us and equips us and enables us to live a life knowing knowing that we are yours eternally. In Jesus' name, we praise you, we thank you, and our prayer is that we glorify you through that knowledge and that life in Jesus. Amen.